Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back. And thank you again for joining us for part two of the hip and knee arthritis webinar series with Dr. Nathan Hale. I just wanted to quickly apologize for last week. I had some technical difficulties at the end of the webinar and it cut off before I could share a little bit more information, but I'll cover that today. Hopefully we have a perfect um, no technology problems today. But anyhow, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'm Terry. I'm the marketing coordinator at Texas Orthopedic Specialists. Just to mention a little bit about our group, for those of you that are new, Texas Orthopedic Specialists is comprised of fellowship trained orthopedic surgeons and subspecialized doctors who provide comprehensive orthopedic and sports medicine solutions. We serve the community surrounding HEB, Keller, and Denton. And our website and contact info is, should be here. Let me see if I can get, that. okay, there. So that's a little bit about our group and there's our website and our contact info just for you to have and this information is in the handout section if you need to refer back to it you should be able to pull that up um, before we start i just want to encourage you all to utilize the questions portion of this webinar and ask any questions or if you have any comments anything about today's webinar please use that questions portion and we'll try to get as many questions answered as possible before um, we run out of time I know last week Dr. Hill went a little bit faster, so you know we'll try to get to as much as we can at the end. But anyhow, all right, Dr. Hill, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Let me see if I can get this sharing set up. One second. Um, here we go. Thanks, Terry, and uh, welcome to everybody that. Uh, has made it into the, the second part of the webinar this week. Today we're going to be talking about uh, hip and or knee replacement specifically. And so here we go. Like Terry mentioned, uh, today's about uh, total and partial knee replacement, and uh, you can see the other uh, upcoming sessions of the webinar that will be happening over the next month. So what is arthroplasty? Defined, it, it's the surgical reconstruction or replacement of a joint, and this can be done at, at almost any joint in the body. Uh, it can be done in the neck, the shoulder, the elbow, wrist, ankle. Uh, here at Texas Orthopedic Specialists, we have, uh, we have specialists that, that do shoulder replacements, elbow replacements and ankle replacements, as well as hip and knee. And so if you or anyone you know has the need for, uh, or if you've got shoulder pain or elbow pain or ankle pain or even wrist pain that's just not getting better, these are some other uh, opportunities that we can, that we offer that can help you with uh, daily pain. So the most common Arthroplasty or joint replacement surgery performed in the United States is uh, the total knee replacement, and that's followed by total hip replacement. Uh, a recent study from 2018 estimates that by 2030, over 600,000 total hips and over 900,000 total knees will be performed in the U.S. And those numbers have varied anywhere from, from this estimate of 1.5 million procedures done in the U.S. To, to all the way up to 3.5 million. So the take home is that this is a widespread disease. Arthritis affects many of us and there's a lot of things that we can do to help patients to feel better. Knee replacement falls into one of two major categories. You can either have a total knee replacement or a partial or also known as a unicompartmental knee replacement. A total knee replacement is pictured here. This, you can see that the, the femur has been capped. I don't know if you can see my pointer here. The femur's been capped here. The tibia, which is this bone here, has been capped with a metal plate. And then there's a plastic liner in between. So that is all three compartments, the, media, the lateral compartment, the medial compartment, and the patellofemoral compartment have been replaced, thus the term total knee replacement. That's... Uh, contrasted with a partial knee replacement. And this is examples of three different types of partial knee replacements. In this case, the medial or the inside compartment's been replaced. 
In the middle picture, the patellofemoral compartment has been replaced. And in this picture on, on the right of the screen, the lateral compartment has been replaced. Of these partial knee replacements, by far the most common done is the medial partial knee replacement, or what we'll refer to it in the rest of the series as a unicompartmental or UKA. So who's a candidate for knee replacement, whether it be total or partial? Age is something I consider uh, very strongly. And so I try to avoid total and uni in patients under 50 and almost never for patients under 40. And the reason for that is that most of these patients are gonna be more active. They're gonna be patients that just aren't happy with the results that we can provide with a mechanical knee replacement. As good as, as, good as these surgeries are in 2020, they're, they're not as good as the knee you were born with. And when we get to these younger patients, especially under 40, a lot of people will go through the grueling process of surgery and then not be super happy with their results. So I use age as kind of a, a first screening tool and try to keep patients over 50. Then I look at x-rays. Is there bone on bone arthritis? And we'll go over what that looks like. If there is bone on bone and you've got a really compelling reason on your x-rays to, to need a knee replacement, then I may, I may fudge a little bit on the age, but um, that, that's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. And then what symptoms do you have? Like we talked about last week, do you have instability? Do you have pain? Is it severe? Is it daily? Is it occasional? And what, what treatment options have we tried? Have you, have you tried anti-inflammatories? How about injections? Have you, have you lost some weight? Or have you done some therapy? These are all things that I consider. And so, you know, and even then after we go through this, a lot of times patients still have questions. And so I've developed a way that I think helps you to know if, if now is the right time. And so the first thing that I, that I ask is, or that we discussed last week, the first thing I, I tell patients is surgery is going to be your last resort. We're not, surgery is not something that very many people want to go through until they get to the point that they have tried everything else and, and nothing else is working. And then surgery is a great option. And so people ask, why don't I offer it to everybody? Why don't we just do a, Why don't we do a joint replacement on anybody that has pain? You know, go ahead. And some people say, well, I'm going to need it at some point in my lifetime. Why can't I just have it now? And the, the fact of the matter is that up to 20% of people will go through the process of having a knee replacement and then not be happy with it. And what that means is the studies that we've done uh, will, will rank how a patient's done and they'll, they'll rank their own outcome and they'll call it either excellent, good, fair, or poor. And so we want all our patients to be in that good or excellent outcome. And unfortunately, through, through the years, we've had a you know, this 15 to 20 percent that have ended up having poor to, or fair or poor outcomes. And we've been able to put our finger on a few things that can that can warn us about someone that may not be a good candidate for a knee replacement. And those are patients that are very young, so less than 55, if they're very active and, and those are uh, runners or patients that participate in CrossFit or other high intensity interval training, uh, or patients that have that do not have bone on bone arthritis on x-ray. So when I have patients that have knee pain that are that are all three of these things, if they're young, if they're really active and they don't have bone on bone, well then I'm I'm pretty hesitant to offer a knee replacement. And it's mostly because that patient's not going to be very happy. And then, and, and, you know, it comes down to the fact that my job is to make sure that you're happy when you leave. So if age and imaging are appropriate, if you're over 55 or even over 50 and you've got really bad arthritis on x-ray, then we ask these three questions. So number one, do you have daily severe pain? And I'll let the patient define that. They can define daily, they define severe. Does your pain limit your activities of daily living? So do you have trouble walking to walking around the house? Do you have trouble getting your pants on? Do you have trouble 
uh, doing things that you have to do to take care of yourself. And then the last question is, do you make major decisions based on your knee pain? And that can mean, that can mean I had one patient say that she didn't go grocery shopping anymore because she was afraid she'd make it back to the milk and not be able to get to her car. I'd say that's a, that's a pretty big limitation and something that if, if patients are having that kind of pain, we can certainly help them. When I was in my training, we had a guy who was 80 years old and his complaint was that he could only get in 80 days on the ski slopes or he couldn't get in his 80 days on the ski slopes. He could only get in 40 days because his knees hurt too bad and he had to take every other day off. So he got a knee replacement and we got him back on the slopes for his 80 days. Now is that, that's not our, that's not the typical patient that's going to ski for 80 days a year, especially out here in Texas. But the the point of this slide is just to say you get to decide what what your limitations are and if you're not happy with the quality of life you have and it's because of your knee pain then we can help you so then the question becomes for those of us that are indicated for surgery that we we think that the the pain is daily and it's enough to go through surgery do we do a partial or do we do a total and things to consider are, we look at the x-rays, are all the compartments involved? If the knee is completely full of arthritis, it wouldn't make sense to do a partial. If there's a deformity, is it correctable? Is the, are the symptoms located medially, laterally, anteriorly, all over the knee? Are the ligaments intact? What's the age? If a patient's awfully young, I may tend more towards a, a partial knee, but you know, if a patient's 85 and they have the, the x-rays and the symptoms and the stability that indicate a partial knee, I'll do that too. So age is at the bottom of the list on this slide because it's something I think about kind of secondary to all these other things. So here's an example of a couple of patients. Uh, these, are, these are relatively similar x-rays. They both have medial compartment osteoarthritis as you can see right here on the inside of the knee. They did not have a uh, significant arthritis in the, throughout the rest of the knee. And so we have a conversation and the patient on the right was a little bit older lady. She was not quite as active and she had some lateral pain. So uh, she gets the, she got a total knee. The guy on the left was a uh, soon to be retired man who was more active and didn't have lateral pain. So he got a partial knee replacement. And those are conversations we have in the clinic and we, and through exam and conversation, we figure out what, what surgery is best for you. These are a couple that are a little bit more obvious. The one on the right was, uh, was a patient who did not have bone on bone changes, but on the MR, or I'm sorry, the one on, on the left, this one here, they, he did not have bone on bone changes, but he had an MRI that showed severe cartilage loss. And so in that setting, the patient gets a partial knee replacement and his x-rays uh, were not back yet, so I couldn't include them. Uh, whereas the patient on the right has severe destructive pattern of tricompartmental or all compartment osteoarthritis. And so that patient got uh, not only a, a knee, a, total knee replacement, but more of a revision style knee replacement. So benefits of a partial knee, it's gonna feel more normal. A total knee is gonna feel a little bit more mechanical, whereas a partial is gonna feel more normal. You typically get a little bit better range of motion. It's bone and ligament preserving. The total knee preserves bone and ligament too, but just not to the extent that the primer, the partial does. You'll have a little bit less painful and easier recovery. And typically, if you did have to have sur further surgery, the revision's a little bit easier. So risks of a partial include, uh, they do have a higher failure rate at 10 years, and there's a higher risk for further surgery. I think there's some bias that goes into these, sur these studies that talk about higher failure rate and higher risk of further surgery, which we can discuss in the clinic if it comes up. But Overall, uh, unicompartmental typically is a little bit easier on the patient and a little bit better function long-term. Benefits of the total knee replacement, it's more commonly done, so protocols are more worked out or a little bit better worked out. 
it's more typically a more common surgery for the surgeon. Things are a little, just a little bit more routine. The outcomes are very predictable and, and they do have excellent outcomes. And the, the risk of revision is a little bit lower. So risks are uh, total knee replacements typically have a little bit more stiffness and the little bit more pain and longer rehab. Overall, both surgeries are very predictable. They both do really, really well. And I think it's a, a matter of having a discussion with the patient and then also looking at x-rays to see uh, which one is going to be the ideal candidate or the ideal surgery for each patient. So once we've made the decision that we need to proceed with surgery or the surgery is going to help, Uh, what are the next steps? And so the first thing is you'll meet with my scheduler. You'll get a, a packet of information that tries to prepare you for every every possible situation that could come up uh, in the course of your surgery. Um, it's a lot of information, but it, it does help to go through it. And then we also supplement that with what we call a joint camp. And uh, prior to the days of COVID, the a couple of the hospitals we work with would provide a joint camp, and it was it was uh, something that the patients really enjoyed. They got a lot of information and they, it really helps to know what to expect on your day of surgery and then post-operatively as well. Uh, because of the limitations that we've had due to this uh, virus, we, we've made our own video. And so we, we provide that to patients uh, as soon as they sign up for surgery. And then the one of my favorite parts about this job is the timing's completely up to the patient for the most part. So if if you decide that you need to have surgery but want to put it off for six months, that's fine. Just if you decide that you've had it and you're at your wit's end and it can't come soon enough, then we can we can schedule that pretty easily as well. So I will expedite surgery or, or push to get it done a little bit sooner if we have a destructive pattern like the one that I showed you beforehand. And that's this x-ray just to show in here again. At, at this point, we start worrying about uh, losing ligaments and needing a bigger surgery and uh, so when, when knees look this bad, I, I do push to have surgery sooner rather than later. And so what, what's the difference between a, a manual total knee replacement and a robotic? And so the first we'll, first we'll go through is a manual total knee. And so um, this is how knees have been done for, for many, many years. Robotics is really more of a, a technology that's come on in the last five to 10 years. and uh, so over time, this has been kind of the mainstay of treatment. So the, first of all, this is a cartoon showing the incision. The incision is going to be the same whether you have a, po a total knee or a partial knee. That's surgeon dependent. Some incisions are a little bit longer than others, but it's typically done in the midline, right over the top of the kneecap. The one of the first steps after the initial approach and release is this. This drill is used to make a uh, or to cannulate the femoral canal. And uh, that is that functions as a a guide for this part of the this guy. That, I'm sorry, the the hole in the femur functions as a guide for this guide, which is going to be the distal end or the end that where you cut off the end of the femur. Then we cut off the end of the the top of the tibia, and I use spacer blocks like this one pictured here to develop and determine what the extension gap is. So the extension gap is the distance between the bones from here to here when the knee is completely straight. And so this device helps me define the extension gap. I then switch to another device that looks just like this, and this is a tension balancer. You, and you, what you do is spread the bones apart in flexion, and this determines the flexion gap. By matching the extension gap and the flexion gap together, we're able to get a knee that is balanced throughout its range of motion. It allows the ligaments to work in the way that they were they were originally designed to work. And balance is typically the, it's the one thing that we look for and depend on in order to have a well-functioning knee replacement. And so by, by balancing our flexion and extension gaps using these two devices, we're able to give good outcomes in, in manual total knee replacement. After, after the balance is achieved, we add this uh, jig to the end of the femur and we're able to make our cuts through, the, through this uh, or using this guide to finish things up. Now, these are some intraoperative photos that are going to be coming up next. And uh, the first one, actually all of them, they, 
they do show surgery or photographs from actual surgery. And so if you are going to be a little bit squeamish, I would, I would suggest that you look away for just the next couple of minutes. I'll tell you when the pictures are off. Uh, but this is the this is after the initial approach, and you can see that the cartilage on the end of the femur here is very unhealthy. It's cracked, it's broken, and it's it's very uh, looks almost like a cobblestone street. You'll also see bone spurs along the edge all all the way around. There's a very big one here, and then this whole edge here is a bone spur. So this is a this is a knee that's about as worn out as you can get. And then uh, when it's all said and done, it's replaced by this uh, metal and plastic knee. Uh, this is the cap that goes on the end of the femur, which is pictured here, plastic piece in the middle, and then uh, the, the metal piece in the tibia there as well. So that's kind of uh, the end. This is the beginning, and then this is more the end product after a, after a total knee replacement. And those look the same whether you're using a manual or a, or a robotic knee. So, Okay, pictures are gone for those of you that looked away. Now to contrast the manual knee with the robotic knee, the, this is a setup of uh, a typical surgical setup for the robotic knee. You'll see the robot or the robotic arm in the middle, and then you'll see the screens that are are also included that guide the surgeon and show show us uh, the what's actually happening in the knee. And then this here on the top of this screen is a camera, and the camera is how the robotic arm. Uh, communicates with the computer and then displays what we see on the screen. This screen shows the preoperative plan for a, a total knee replacement done with the robot. By looking at this, we're able to look at several things, and and I'll I'll be brief, but uh, but we do get to look at the. You'll notice here on the screen it says varus. That's going to be the alignment of the tibia and then we can change we can change that um, by half degrees whole degrees we can, it's very precise and we can change the the alignment of the tibia and the femur in the middle screen here you'll see we can change the rotation of the femoral component and in the bottom picture we can change the rotation of the tibial component and then on the side here we can change the flexion of the femoral component and then we can also change the slope of the tibia and so all this is done completely beforehand. And rather than doing intraoperative balancing, we'll do preoperative balancing. And it, it allows us to get a, a really good idea and sometimes the complete clinical picture of how the knee is going to feel post-op before we ever make any cuts on the knee. It also enables us to be very precise in the small changes that we do make in order to achieve optimum balance in a total knee replacement. Uh, we also have the capability of doing this in partial knee replacement, and uh, the process is very similar. So before surgery, patients that are going to have robotic knee replacement have a CT scan, and uh, an example of a CT scan of the knees pictured here. The CT scan gives a gives a map to the computer about what to expect and and exactly a very ideal and uh, detailed. A uh, picture of 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 exactly what we're we're looking at in the knee. That project the CT scan then projects in 3D on the screens to your right, and it shows this is a picture of the CT scan that is generated by the computer. The dots uh, that you see on the on the femur on the top and the tibia on the bottom are points that we can use a probe to reference and what and all these dots all they're going to do is they're going to they're going to mate the ct scan with where the knee is in space so having memorized the ct scan the robotic arm can then determine where that those parts of the knee are in space and they're able to follow the knee uh, throughout space wherever it is after the registration has been done the registration then communicates with the robot and uh, does exactly like I said, allows it to follow the knee in space. Intraoperatively, uh, this is a picture of of exactly what we see. The a few things that you'll notice here: the the green is the this is a, a view of the tibia looking looking from top down, 
and the blue is the saw blade and that's the that's the exact size of the saw blade and the the green is the area where we need to make our cuts so advantages of this are we can be very precise we can make minor adjustments that we wouldn't be able to make accurately without the robot and those things help us to achieve optimal balance and then another uh, thing that I really like about this this robotic system in general in particular is this green line that you see following around the knee and that's what we call a haptic boundary and so the beyond the green line is soft tissue around the knee and rarely in total knee replacement some of those soft tissues can be injured either by a stray saw blade or um, you know typically by by a saw blade and so because of that haptic boundary the robot disables the saw to go beyond that and so it it decreases the incidence of soft tissue injury in total knee arthroplasty we can also pull this screen back up intraoperatively if there's anything we don't like if we run into something that if we run into a balance issue and we're just not happy with the balance we're getting we can make small adjustments we can make uh, half degree cuts uh, in either flexion or varus or valgus or even rotation and uh, this enables us to have optimal control over all the cuts we make and it helps our balance to be uh, as good as it can possibly be in the end. If you'd like more information or if you if you want to see a total a robotic total knee in action you can go to this link um, it's available on YouTube and we also have the same link available to us on our uh, Texas Orthopedic Specialist Facebook page and this is of me kind of walking walking people through a total knee and showing some uh, footage from intraoperatively and, and talking about how, how we do things in the operating room. So feel free to, to view that on your, at your leisure. So whether you do have a partial or a total or a robotic or a manual knee, the day of surgery runs very similar. You'll arrive at the hospital and get settled in the preoperative area. You'll meet the nurse, who'll put an IV in. Then you meet with the anesthesiologist and myself. The anesthesiologist will talk about different options for anesthesia, whether that be spinal or general. Then you go through and have your operation. You go to the hospital room and work with the physical therapist. And then patients typically go home on post-op day one, or then some patients that are, are young and active enough can actually go home day of surgery. And I think this may be the most important slide of uh, of this presentation and this is why I think it's I don't think there's a better time in in our history to be able to have a total knee replacement and a lot of that is based on the not necessarily the prosthesis or the surgical techniques that we've come up with but it's the all the details surrounding that and recently many hospitals including the the ones that I operate at have adopted this ERAS protocol or advanced recovery after surgery and what that what that entails is, first of all, optimization, and that's involved with seeing your primary care physician. We look at your labs, we look at your blood counts, we look at other medical problems and make sure that we're going to be able to achieve an optimum outcome based on uh, your medical history. It makes no sense to do a, a great knee replacement or a great surgery if, if we're going to run into a, a medical complication, and so we try to avoid that at all costs. We have shorter fasting times, and so rather than the typical eight hours with nothing to eat or drink, we, we've shortened that to no food for six hours, and you can have clear liquids up until two hours before your procedure. We use modern anesthesia. I typically use spinal anesthesia for my surgeries, but modern general does really well too. Uh, either one of those are great options. We use a local anesthetic injection during the surgery, and, and this is quite honestly one of the major strides forward that we've made in total knee replacement is by using uh, a local, a long-acting local anesthetic injection, specifically in the back of the knee, but also all around the knee. This enables us to have, uh, to proceed with therapy at a much more increased rate and it actually enables people to go home on post-op day zero sometimes. I think without that, this uh, local anesthetic injection, uh, I'm not sure those things would be possible. We have a, 
markedly decreased blood loss than traditionally in, in total knee replacement, and that's through a, a drug called tranexamic acid that's routinely given in surgery. We use multimodal analgesia, so after surgery, my patients all take scheduled Tylenol, and the ones that are able that don't have kidney or stomach problems take scheduled anti-inflammatory like Celebrex or Naproxen. And, and by combining those two medications at the doses with, with which we use them, it enables us to really limit our narcotic medications. And most patients are only requiring uh, one narcotic script. And um, sometimes patients need refills, but that's very, very uncommon to even need a refill of your narcotic. We don't typically use drains or catheters, so the number of tubes that you've got um, after surgery are much less. We use rapid mobilization and therapy, meaning you're, you're gonna be up and walking the day of surgery and uh, home the day after. And then we, we, do our, we are very efficient in our discharge. I, I believe that you weren't sick when you came in, and so there's no reason to treat you like you're sick and leave you in the hospital for a long time after the surgery. So um, that's kind of an overview of, of, total, of total knee arthroplasty, uh, definitely a rapid fire. Uh, it's kind of a brief overview of partial knee, total knee, and then um, what's best for, for each individual patient. So um, I do think that 2020 is an excellent time. I think we've really worked out a lot of the kinks of doing total knee arthroplasty. And if, uh, if you're in that situation where you've, dealt with knee pain for a long, long time and nothing else is seeming to work, I think it's an excellent operation that can really help improve your quality of life and pain control. So uh, at this time, I'll, I'll take any questions and I'll, I'll turn it back over to Terry. All right, thank you, Dr. Hill, that was great. Um, I have a couple great questions. Uh, the first one is from Ladina and she is asking, I had knee procedure done last year in March, but still not able to walk up and down the stairs comfortably. What should be done? That's a great question. Um, I, I think it depends on what kind of procedure you've had. If, if that procedure is a total knee replacement or even a partial knee replacement and, it's all, and you're only about, I guess if it was done in March, that would make you four months out. So if, if you're about four months out and it, and it was an arthroplasty, I highly recommend waiting at least a year. Uh, we, have, we have good evidence that shows that your, your knee replacement um, will improve the most between 12, six and 12 weeks, but you will see improvement from your pain and improve your activities and um, functional status for up to a year. So if it's a knee replacement you've had and it's only been a matter of months, I highly recommend waiting until a full year before you pass final judgment on that procedure. If it was an arthroscopic procedure like a men meniscectomy or a cleanup job or, or something to that degree that was not an arthroplasty, then I'd say come and see me and we can talk about other options. We can talk about injections if that's failed or it may be time to proceed with a total or a partial knee arthroplasty. Perfect. Um, I have another question. This one I got via email, so I wanted to throw it out here. Um, it's from Robert. He said, one knee has bone on bone for some time. Currently, pain is mostly not a problem. Does waiting a year or more for surgery risk damage that might complicate knee replacement later? Another great question, and I think we we hit we hit on this a little bit earlier. I, I think that if you have the standard run of the mill bone on bone arthritis that's not a destructive pattern, it you can wait a year, two years, you can wait as long as you want. If the if the pain's not bothering you, then then I would recommend avoiding surgery. Uh, if you it, it would be a good idea to come in and get an x-ray just to rule out a destructive pattern of arthritis, because if we're worried about losing ligaments and uh, if there's if there's massive bone loss, then then I I think there is some uh, some wisdom in in making surgery happen sooner rather than later, but only in that situation of uh, advanced bone loss and the destructive pattern of arthritis. Okay, this next question is from Vivian. Why does the knee replacement utilize metal at the end of the femur and a plastic insert? Why not all metal? And that, that's a that's a good question. That's actually been tried in the hip, 
and the results were catastrophically bad. When you have two metal surfaces that uh, articulate, they they generate small um, metal particles. The body then attacks those metal particles to try to remove them from the body, and the as a matter of uh, collateral damage, there's significant bone loss, significant soft tissue destruction, and uh, basically uh, catastrophic outcomes have been uh, reported in metal on metal hip replacements. Um, and so to try that in the knee, uh, I think we would I think we would end up with just as bad, if not worse outcomes. Um, the plastic can wear out, but it's uh, it's a little bit it lasts longer and it's more well tolerated than a metal on metal articulation. But that's a great question. And she has another question. Um, what determines if you do a robotic procedure versus a manual procedure? Any disadvantages to doing it robotically? <clears throat> At this point, there's, so like I told you before, the, the robotic procedure is relatively new. We, we now have five-year data that show excellent outcomes with robotic knee surgery, um, but we've got you know 30 and 40-year data on manual knee surgery. And so the, I don't think there's a downside to doing, to doing the surgery robotically. Um, there is a, there's a small issue of cost and the patients have to have a CT scan. There's all, that's also a very small, or a, that's an increased amount of radiation. So if you're worried about that, then uh, I think that, I think that would be the one downside or the one risk, but from an intraoperative perspective, I don't, I don't see a downside of, uh, of performing the surgery robotically. Um, on the flip side, there, we still haven't, I haven't seen data that shows that robotic surgery has better outcomes than manual surgery either. So those, those results may be coming as we get uh, five and 10 year data, but um, at this point, uh, whether you have a robotic surgery or a well done uh, manual surgery, the outcomes are relatively the same. The robotic surgery does uh, enable us to uh, decrease the amount of outliers or, or malpositioned uh, knee replacements that are that um, can occur um, from time to time. Okay, great. Um, another question, what's the difference between spine and general anesthesia? So general anesthesia means you have a tube down your throat uh, that, and a breathing machine breathes for you. Um, spinal anesthesia is where an injection is placed in your back and local anesthesia or local um, like numbing medicine is placed around your spine. It, uh, it makes you not be able to feel anything below that level of the spine, and, but you are awake during surgery. Now, don't let that scare you because the, we can use medication that enables you to be as, as awake or as sleepy as you want to be. So um, I prefer spinal anesthesia because it, uh, it provides a little bit more relaxation during the surgery. It provides a little bit better pain control after surgery, and it decreases the amount of nausea and vomiting um, and dizziness associated with, uh, or, and just real grogginess associated with general anesthesia. Um, however, most of the anesthesiologists that I work with are very talented and very good at general anesthesia too. So we don't run into a whole lot of um, of those side effects. But I I do feel like uh, spinal anesthesia is um, is preferable, is a little bit safer, and um, and and you, you you're certainly not awake during surgery. You can be as sleepy as you want to be. Okay, we got another question. Let me see. Sorry, I, you're getting a lot, which is great. Um, do you do both knees at the same time? That's from Bernard. If I can avoid it, I do not do both knees at the same time. Um, I think that the the risk of uh, complication is is higher if you do both knees at the same time. There's an increased risk of blood loss. There's there's more pain. The rehab's longer, um, and 
there's a there's actually a, a very recent study from just this month shows that you've got a higher risk of ending up in the ICU after your surgery if you do both knees at the same time. Now there are selected uh, instances when I will do that if a, if patients have severe arthritis on both sides and their knees are stuck in flexion then sometimes I will do both knees at the same time because having a flexion contracture or a knee that won't straighten all the way out is a risk for having a bad outcome on the contralateral side. So for instance, if, you're, if your knees are so bad that your right knee won't straighten all the way out, but your left knee hurts more, um, by doing the left knee first, if you're still walking with a bent knee on the right, you may not achieve your full range of motion on the left. And so if in that I, you know, specific scenario, sometimes I will do two at the same time. Um, if a patient is, if a patient is very young and very healthy, no medical problems, then I'll consider it, but I really don't like doing both of them at the same time. Okay, the next question is, who isn't a good candidate? 87-year-old mom takes blood thinner and is mostly sedentary. So I think that I think that somebody that has knee pain that is not the limiting factor in their life would probably be a bet would probably not be a good candidate but if the patient is mostly sedentary because their knees hurt then I think that there should at least be a consideration of um, or an evaluation and see what we could do to help her uh, I actually have a patient in my clinic who's 86 years old. She came to me oh, six months ago and said, I need an injection because my knees hurt so bad I can't walk. Well, I took a look at her DX rays and an injection wasn't going to help her. They're just too far gone. And so we did one of her knees back in February or January. We did another knee a couple of months ago and she's as happy as can be. She walks without pain. She lives by herself she does great. And so just being 87 years old or 86 years old doesn't, doesn't preclude you from having a knee surgery. Being on a blood thinner certainly doesn't preclude you from having a knee surgery, but um, it's really more of the activity level. What's, what's causing the limitations. If, if you've got really bad heart and lung disease, really bad diabetes and those types of things that are limiting your activities, then, a, you know, having a knee replacement is not going to really fix that. But if you're overall healthy and the knee pain is the main limiting factor in your life, then I, I, I certainly take age into consideration, but I won't disqualify somebody just by having um, being a little bit older. Other things that, that I do that do disqualify patients for me are things like uncontrolled diabetes, um, smoking, uh, morbid obesity. Those are types of things that will compromise an outcome. And like I've mentioned before, I want to make sure my, my goal is to make you better and not make you worse. And so if if you've got these risk factors for poor outcomes, then I'm we're going to try to optimize those outcomes, optimize those things that we can optimize before we do surgery. Great. Um, Christine asked, I had a total knee in 2017 with excellent results with PT at home three times a week for four to six weeks. I know that helped me attain full motion and full extension and bend, and I'm walking three to four miles a day. What are the current PT guidelines for total for a total knee? I think you're talking about uh, current post-op guidelines. And so many of us have moved away from the home health uh, therapy. Uh, that I think it doesn't matter. Um, whether you have therapy at home or out in a in a an outpatient physical therapy center, um, I have noticed that um, when I send patients to outpatient therapy, I know exactly who's going to be treating those patients. When I send them to home health, I don't always know, and so sometimes uh, the the actual therapy can be hit or miss if if it's a pa if it's a therapist that I don't know well or haven't worked with before. And so that that in itself is uh, drives my preference for outpatient therapy. And then also I prefer outpatient therapy because if you if you have therapy in your house, they come to you. So you basically just get up and you do your therapy. If you're able if you have to go out, then you're getting up, getting dressed, walking to the car, getting out of the car, getting into the therapy and 
I think it triples the amount of therapy you get each day. So I prefer an outpatient physical therapy, but I, I certainly have patients that have done home health therapy and they have had excellent results as well. So the current recommendation is to use outpatient physical therapy, unless something precludes you from getting to outpatient physical therapy, in which case home health is also acceptable. Are these procedures currently considered as elective and can they be done or cannot, can they not be done because of COVID? So these patient, the as a general rule, uh, arthroplasty is considered elective surgery. However, that that is always left to the discretion of the physician. And so I have a few patients in my clinic now that if we, if the powers that be were to tell us that it was not prudent to do elective surgery, I would still go forward with them because they either have massive bone loss or they're at risk of having a, a complication if we were to wait or just for some other reason, it's not safe to wait. So as a general rule, uh, elective, or as a general rule, arthroplasty or joint replacement of the hip and knee for arthritis is considered elective, but there are certain cases that are not elective and all this should be left to the discretion of the treating surgeon. Okay, I think that was our last question from um, our virtual attendees, but I have a question or maybe a comment that maybe I want you to clarify about robotic total knees. I think there's some myths that the robot's in control. Can you explain, you know, the role the robot plays and helps you as a surgeon? Just kind of explain that to everyone. Sure. So this, the, act, the robotic arm that I use is, is simply a tool. And it's a, a tool that makes my ability to be precise uh, a little bit sharper. So the robot doesn't make any, doesn't do any motions that are not completely controlled by me in the operating room. The, the robot doesn't even come into position until I bring it into position and the saw blade doesn't turn on unless I'm holding the trigger. So it's, it's basically just a, a more advanced tool to be able to achieve optimal balance and optimal outcomes um, in total knee arthroplasty. So the it's it's basically a fancy CT guided bone saw. So um, if anybody's worried about the robot, you know, having a bad outcome because the robot went haywire or didn't do its job, uh, I think those you can put those uh, fears to rest because the the surgeon's in complete control the whole time and the, the robot is simply a tool for him him or her to use. Okay, great. Thank you so much for all those amazing questions. Thank you, Dr. Hill, for that awesome presentation. Very informative. Um, I just want to encourage everyone to, um, well, thank you, Dr. Hale. I just want to say thank you again. I'm going to go through some steps with everybody. I just want to say thanks to everybody that tuned in. And uh, if you do have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're on we're on Facebook, YouTube, uh, next door, and uh, and also available by phone or email here at the clinic. So uh, thanks to everybody that was involved, and I look forward to speaking with you again next week. Y'all have a good one. Thank you, Dr. Hale. All right, everyone, just a few um, announcements, just so you have them, if some of you that are still on. I know it was a great presentation, but I just want to encourage you all to join us next Wednesday at noon for part three. Dr. Hill will talk about revision knee replacement surgery. Um, feel free to share the webinar links with anybody that you think would benefit from um, hearing from Dr. Hill. These are great educational events. There's our Facebook page, our Twitter account, um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Dr. Hale has some great videos on our YouTube channel. That robotic total knee replacement video is on there. It's great. He also has an osteoarthritis video on there. And finally, just take a look at his health grades um, reviews. He's got some great testimonials on there just so you can get a little bit more information on what patients are saying about him. All right. Thank you all so much and have a great day.